Hello, and welcome back for another special Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Hope you're enjoying the December issue that's currently out. Um, we're getting a lot of good feedback on it. Um, it's chock full of good content. We hope you'll agree. And one of the most popular sections of the magazine is always the book review department. Um, often people will flip to that first. I know I'm like that. Many of the journals I receive, you, you want to get to those book reviews and to kind of kid in the candy store, what's out there that's new and my that I'm interested in that I want to read. And I draw your attention to that in this issue because um, one of the uh, main reviews is a, a book, an exciting new book by a longtime frequent contributor to Naval History Magazine, David Sears. And the book is Duel in the Deep. And we're here to talk about this um, barn burner of a tale from World War II with the author, um, who we're glad to welcome to the podcast. David, hello. Good to Thank see you. you. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on the book and the, um, well, rather glowing review in the current issue of Naval Thank History. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's it's a worthwhile review. Um, this book is a page turner, and it's a it's quite an inspiring story from the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, from the um, sort of culminating phase of the Battle of the Atlantic. We recently covered some of this in the magazine uh, this past year. Um, and it's uh, as the tide has turned finally on the U-boats, uh, as 1943 goes on. And this is a story from, well, it focuses on, I'm going to let the author tell you this, but it focuses on the uh, USS Bory, uh, DD-215, a fairly aging Clemson-class destroyer, and the crew of this ship and the remarkable um, war record they achieved uh, 80 years ago this past October. They're involved in um, one of the most stun stunning uh, battles uh, of the war in terms of ship-on-ship -ship fights. So, um, David, you do a good job of sort of setting the stage for the sort of climactic showdown um, of the destroyer with U-405. Uh, you kind of set the backdrop of the Battle of the Atlantic and what's going on at this point in the war and that battle. So maybe if you can uh, get the ball rolling, we're talking about that some. Yeah, sure. I, you know, part of the uh, the book is is kind of emphasizing uh, not so much the the so often the Battle of the Atlantic is told from either the German or the British uh, perspective. Yeah. And this is an effort to uh, introduce the U.S. Navy to the, the Battle of the Atlantic. And basically, uh, you know, the U.S. Navy had joined the fight in the Atlantic uh, simultaneously to the war in the Pacific. And it wasn't until mid-1943 um, that they began to go on the offensive. So... The, the story of the Bory and the U-405 is kind of the, the through story, you know, the dramatic impact of that effort. But there's also a, a background when it comes to, you know, things like code breaking and uh, technology and uh, operational changes that um, made the U.S. Navy come into its own in, in the latter part of 1943 and then obviously until the end of, of the war. So it's a... a the duel in the deep, while the primary story is about the uh, Bory versus the U-405, it's also about uh, how the U.S. Navy came into its own in, in battling the U-boats. After a pretty um, awful start, you know, uh, in the direct af aftermath of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, um, the U.S. experienced kind of a second Pearl Harbor, more slow rolling, and actually more devastating uh, with uh, the German U-boat attacks on the eastern seaboard of the United States and, and Canada. Um, and actually the, the you know, statistical devasta devastation was more far reaching uh, than uh, Pearl Harbor in terms of ships lost and lives lost in the first, uh, let's say six to eight months of uh, 1942. So I'm trying to pick up the story from there, uh, giving that background and then showing as a kind of an iconic example of how uh, an aging U.S. Navy destroyer took on um, a U-boat and the rather remarkable clash that uh, resulted uh, from that uh, from that incident. Remarkable indeed. And I look forward to getting to that in a minute. So let's you're, you're right. 1943 is a 
quite a different year for the Allies in the Battle of the Atlantic in 1942 was. Um, and the the change really starts happening that spring. There's a final um, all-out blowout assault by the U-boats, uh, sinking mania going on. And we turned the tide on them um, uh, in that spring of 43. Um, so let's talk about some of the the ways that it's the kind of the tables get turned on the um yeah, the sure. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, uh, May 1943 has always been has, been has been used as a turning point in the battle. And it's a turning point, particularly for the uh, British in the uh, North Atlantic. Um, they're using their cumulative tactics. They have more escort uh, type vessels. They have uh, broken and continue to break the uh, German naval codes. Although that was kind of, you know, the the Germans uh, were also <laughs> breaking in on uh, Allied codes. So it, it was kind of a counterbalance thing. But for the Americans, um, it, it's the, the impact really came through the uh, proliferation of these new escort uh, destroyers. Uh, the British uh, in the North Atlantic had the advantage of using long range uh, liberators. B-24s, I believe, um, in closing what was called the, you know, the black hole or the air gap where air coverage was not possible early in the war. And the counterpoint for, for the United States was the, um, uh, the launching and the operational capacity of these um, uh, baby flat tops, these uh, uh, escort destroyers. For the Americans, it, it was the use of uh, escort destroyers, which actually uh, closed the gap in the central Atlantic. In other words, the, the long-range bombers couldn't handle the gap in the in the central Atlantic. The uh, baby flat tops escort carriers could. And um, so that was a new feature. And uh, not only was the the code breaking available to the U.S. Navy, they were on balance more willing than the British uh, to use the uh, product of that code breaking. For example, there was a, a campaign against the large U-tankers, the, the ships, the boats that refueled the smaller U-boats. And those were um, concentrated in the, in the Central Pacific and you know there's always been this issue of uh why were the americans more willing to use the results of code and risk the possibility that the germans might find out that they had access to the codes well from the american perspective um the re refueling operations in other words the u tanker operations could be um uh, they required lead time, logistical lead time to set up those uh, refueling rendezvous. And the Americans felt that they could use that lead time to have uh, escort carriers positioned to uh, actually detect uh, these refueling operations, which were ideal opportunities to take on multiple U-boats. And so that was the impact of the uh, escort carriers. And because of the escort carriers, ships like the Bori, these uh, ancient four pipers, um, in the still in the absence of destroyer escorts, they became the escort vessels for these carrier attack groups. Um, planes could uh, fly and detect and fight U-boats um, on the surface during daylight, um, but they couldn't at night. I mean, they could take off and land, but they couldn't uh, track down and assault U-boats. So the Bori, um, on this one evening, uh, Halloween evening, 1943, got its opportunity by itself to uh, track down and sink a U-boat. And that's how the, uh, in a rather confused way, that's how this opportunity came about. And um, it is quite... An, an amazing one-on-one -on -one, um, ship duel. Duel in the Deep is a um, ideal title to describe this engagement. Uh, rarely do you have such a um, kind of deck-to-deck, -deck, um, all hands um, in the fight kind of uh, right. engagement in modern naval warfare, which makes it so fascinating. 
why don't you uh, give them give the uh, viewers the blow by blow? It's a, quite a story. Well, I'll give them a couple blows, but I'd, I'd rather they read the book to find find out the outcome. Don't, give them the, don't read the entire that part, but just you yeah. Know, uh, I mean, for them. the uh, you know the reason for the the close in battle was kind of a quirk. Uh, it's it was not that unusual for uh, destroyers or for uh, escort vessels, destroyer type escort vessels, to try to ram U-boats. The British did it uh, quite often, although they, although they did it most often when uh, they were in company. In other words, if something catastrophic occurred because of the ramming attempt, there'd be other ships around to uh, pick up the pieces, other escorts around to pick up the pieces. Um, in this case, uh, uh, the Bori was on its own. Uh, the ramming attempt actually went uh, not as expected. Uh, there was more of a swipe, side swipe than a, than a collision. And for a vital 10 to 15 minutes, uh, the, uh, the Bori, which is a, a surface ship, uh, rode atop the deck of a U-boat, which obviously is a submersible. So they were stuck together um, and unable to disengage. And the only alternative for each crew at, at that point was to, um, you know, exit their ships. More, you know, more dangerous for the U-boat, obviously, but to fight in the open. And although it wasn't quite, uh, it was not a hand-to-hand -hand fight, but it was close. It was uh, using small arms, machine guns, um, twenty-millimeter cannons on both sides, uh, and even to the extent of throwing objects, mainly shell casings, uh, using flare guns. Um, it was a real set to during those uh, 15 minutes. Um, and I, I think from that standpoint, unprecedented, and also from the standpoint that um, Bori was alone. Uh, you know, there, there actually probably were other U-boats in the area, uh, but Bori was more than uh, uh, 30 miles uh, from, uh, from any uh, effort to uh, clean up the pieces. And it was at night um, in, you know, one of the deepest part of the ocean. So it was a, you know, it was, it was certainly brave, if not foolhardy to, to make the assault. But once it happened, uh, there was uh, bravery, bravery and tragedy on, on both sides. And I, I kind of leave it up to the, the reader to find out, uh, you know, the, the aftermath of that battle was really kind of um, dynamic or you know, certainly dramatic as well as uh, dynamic. Yeah, I want to touch on that too in a moment. Um, so um, just to get it straight for the viewers, yeah, he, the, the destroyer tries to ram the U-boat, but you say it, it's not like a clear shot, you know, T, right? It's yeah, more there was, like, yeah like it a, was more like a, a yeah, angle, right? Absolutely, like a, you know, a heavy side swipe, really. But, yeah, and, not like that. And then they're jammed together. Now, in the... Um, the shootout that ensues, the close quarter shootout, the height advantage of um, those on board of the destroyer um, would have yeah, been something. Yeah, you know, the, the Bori had the advantage of, of um, uh, you know, <laughs> elevation, I guess. They had the advantage. But understand that this is a World War I era uh, destroyer. It's, you know, it's 20 plus years old. It's um, very thin skinned. I mean, it really earned its moniker as a tin can. It was r rolled steel, I believe. It, the hull was three eight three eight inches thick, so it's very thin. Yeah. Uh, so the longer that um, the bory was exposed, uh, the more danger to the bory because the uh, the U four hundred five has a rather sturdy a sturdier structure than the uh, destroyer. So it wasn't a total advantage for the Americans. Certainly, uh, elevation it was, but not for um, you know the, the the structures of the the, the two right. ships, two boats. And, and that plays in in a big way, right? I mean, when the, the Bori finally manages to disengage from the other vessel, um, taken on water pretty bad, correct? Yeah, it's it's leaking. Uh, and um, it's got, you know, a speed advantage, but how, you know, how long can this go on? It's taking on water. Um, on the surface, um, the Bori is still faster than the, the U-boat, but um, I know the captain wondered, how, you know, how long can this go on? How long can I keep up this battle and still stay afloat? 
right? Um, in some ways, the um, the remarkable story of survival at sea that comes after the um, Donny Brook of a naval fight that has just happened is almost as inspiring in um, a story of these men and, and their courage and fortitude. They just do not give up the ship. And uh, it becomes a real uh, challenge to keep yeah, the thing does. long enough to survive. Right. They, I mean, after, you know, when the, the battle is, is done, um, the Bori uh, is critically uh, wounded. The ship itself is critically wounded and has to make its way back uh, to uh, the other escorts and, and doing it on a stormy night in the dark and running out of fuel. And mainly, you know, the, the main problem was uh, getting pure feed water to the boilers. I mean, there was contamination and eventually uh, the turbines were going to freeze up. Uh, and when they froze up, and there was all kinds of repercussions, including the ability to uh, uh, to communicate uh, with the with the task group. Right. It's a remarkable. It's a quite a remarkable um, story at sea. Indeed, it's the uh, the battle itself, and then the aftermath of the battle is a story unto itself. Um, and you do a nice job in this book, David, of setting the, the, the stage of like we we meet the crew, the, the officers and crew of the Bori before we get to the main action, which I think humanizes their uh, achievement um, quite a bit. Do you, do you care? Maybe talk about the lieutenant who was the skipper of the Bori a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, talk about the crew in general. I'm, <laughs> I live in, I happen to live in New Jersey. I've lived in here for a number of years. And I, it was remarkable to me that um, the enlisted crew, uh, many of them were drawn from a, a local uh, reserve unit in New Jersey. And most or many of them were uh, teenagers or just coming out of their teenage years. And I thought it was interesting, um, probably not remarkable to some, but uh, a lot of these sailors, when they actually came aboard, on board the uh, Bori, uh, they didn't have uniforms or they'd just been issued uniforms. And by and large, they'd had no prior training. So uh, it, that's probably more akin to the age of sail where uh, the, the sailors learned all they learned about the Navy once they were actually on board the ships. And, you know, there was a, somewhat of a contrast with the uh, officers of the ship. They were, uh, they were inexperienced, too. Most of them were pr the product of the V7 program coming out of uh, universities. Um, and it's kind of a, there is a class distinction. Uh, the New Jersey uh, sailors uh, style themselves as street kids. You know, they were street savvy, uh, not water savvy, but street savvy. Um, and the, um, the officers, they were from a higher stratum. They were university uh, graduates. Um, you know, questionable about whether they'd actually had the opportunity to to lead uh, individuals in battle, but uh, you know, both sides, both the sailors and the officers, kind of learned as they they went along. Um, you know, I've written this is my fifth uh, military history, and in previous ones, either about World War II or about Korea, uh, a large feature has been the ability to uh, contact and interview some of the veterans. Not so much to get their version of events, although that's a, that's a component, but to get their reactions, their emotional reactions of how it was and how it felt at the time. Um, and in this case, it's, uh, and going forward, it's obviously more difficult to, to do that. There aren't that many uh, surviving veterans, fewer every day, obviously. And so there was more reliance on, you know, diaries and uh, letters. And interestingly, also on newspaper clippings. I, I went after, you know, small town newspapers where uh, the sailors uh, would be contacted immediately after the battle. And, you know, it was a, a good um, opportunity to pick up quotes and, and um, impressions uh, taken right, right after the battle occurred. Um, so I relied on those kind of secondary sources, I guess, maybe they're tertiary sources of um, letters and uh, diaries and, and newspaper clippings. But oh, they were, you know, the, the sailors were remarkable. They imagine 
your first uh, introduction to the Navy, uh, you're, you know, you're you're arriving with uniforms you haven't tried on, and and uh, you've never been on board a ship before. And what happens on this? Uh, that what ensues for these sailors is just so phenomenal. It really would make a gripping film, actually. Um, yeah, I hope the option gets picked up. Yes. Yeah. That, I, 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 I don't jest. I mean, it's, it's clearly a, um, a, 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 pic, a story that would lend itself to a motion picture treatment. Um, whenever I see like a, a cat and mouse destroyer versus U-boat kind of scenario, which sure. this is, I'm always reminded of um, one of my favorite World War II naval films. In fact, one of my all-time favorite naval films, uh, the enemy below. Yes, Robert film. Mitchum and Kurt Jurgens. Right. It's yeah, such. A I, I mean, I'm not sure if you know. Conceivably, uh, that movie, uh, you know, the the story I'm telling in this book may have featured in the the scenario for that movie. I, I know it's kind of the analogous uh, uh, analogous situation. I'm not sure of a direct connection, but I'm yeah, I'm aware right. of that movie. It, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, stories like the story of. Uh, the Bory versus U-505 certainly probably informed the uh, script writers in their fictional treatment, but um, in a general sense, but it's just such a great uh, chess game between these two uh, rival adversary captains, you know, and um, the, the German skipper is not treated as a um, third Reich ideologue in any way. It's just a captain versus a captain at sea. And uh, trying to out, outwit each outwit and outmaneuver yeah. each other. I mean, Fast I, movie. I, 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 I think we're going watching the, you know, you know, even before the the battle actually occurs and, and certainly after it happens, I think um, there was there were respect there was respect on on both sides of the equation. I mean I think uh, um, the sailors and officers of the boy realized that uh, um, the people on the the sailors, the submariners on the opposite side, uh, were humans. They certainly could appreciate uh, the fragile nature of the U-boat and how uh, having a U-boat destroyed could be devastating in terms of um, the crew's ability to uh, survive. So I think there was respect, um, mariner versus mariner, in those in those types of uh, situations didn't mean that they were any less or any more forgiving uh, than they otherwise would be, but um, they knew that there were uh, human beings on the other side. Right, right. Um, yet still an incredibly remarkably hard fought battle on, on both sides, um, despite that. Another remarkable aspect of these kind of things. But uh, yes, your book has inspired me to uh, rewatch uh, that 1955 <laughs> uh, The Enemy Below during the um, holiday, sure. holiday season. So um, I okay. recommend that anyone out there, it's <laughs> worth rewatching. Um, so, um, what's uh, this is your, did you say your fifth? Yeah, it's my fifth military history, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all great. And uh, like, like, yeah. Uh, do you have anything currently uh, you've got in the works for uh, your next well, project? Well, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm always hesitant to do that until I have a contract. Um, but, you know, one thing I am looking at, it's kind of interesting, um, uh, the very final days of the uh, of the Battle of the Atlantic from the uh, American perspective, um, uh, in the very last days, uh, the U.S. Navy was uh, uh, positioned to uh, – Cut off a, a group called a Group Sea Wolf, which was a a, a group of a, eight uh, U-boats that were heading again, like they were just after Pearl Harbor, heading again for the Eastern Seaboard. And there was some um, suspicion or concern that these U-boats may be capable of uh, uh, launching V1 or V2 type missiles against. Uh, major cities on the eastern seaboard. Um, it actually didn't happen, but the story of why there was that concern and the steps that were taken to, uh, uh, to deal with it are, are pretty dramatic in themselves and, and come down to the, uh, coming down to the wire in the Battle of the Atlantic. I know that you know, just uh, several days before Germany surrendered, um, 
there was concern that uh, U-boats were still uh, running up and down the East Coast and threatening uh, uh, merchant ships. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a wor worthy follow-up to uh, your current book, for sure. Um, this is kind of a frivolous question, but do you, do you um, as a historical researcher and writer and just a history enthusiast, do you, do you find the Pacific War or the Atlantic War one or the other more compelling, or are they two apples and oranges to compare in that way? I when guess you're working apple, on apples and oranges to a certain extent. I mean, I've my previous four books have either dealt with uh, uh, the Pacific War or the Korean War, obviously from from the Asian perspective, um, and I do think that the Battle of the Atlantic uh, has been uh, from from American historians and writers' perspective, uh, you know, it's been kind of getting, gotten short shrift and has been um, uh, the, the stories written by British authors and even even by uh, Germans has kind of uh, um, made it a, a British-German uh, type of conflict. But in terms of um, the strategic impact on World War II, remember that Germany first, uh, defeating Germany first was the strategic um, uh, priority in uh, World War II. And to make that happen, to defeat Germany, um, you needed to have an invasion of uh, Northern Europe, D-Day in June 1944. And to make that possible, you had to have the logistics pipeline protected, in other words, from the arsenal of democracy, the United States, getting um, troops and material and technology over to um, the British Isles as a, as a launching pad. You needed to protect that, um, that, that logistics flow. And, and, it, and at some points, although it was never, uh, it's kind of disputed whether there was a threat that 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 logistics supply line could be might be cut off. It was essential that um, that that uh, pipeline be maintained. Um, it was a you know British concern, but it was also an American concern. And this you know I guess the the uh, both the Pacific and the Atlantic share the fact that uh, America U.S. Navy started out on the ropes. And as it did in as it did in the Pacific, it uh, made a comeback. So I think it's important to to share how that happened and and some of the stories uh, uh, from that. You know, the the Battle of the Atlantic is kind of an unusual conflict because um, it's not a case of you know not a case of island hopping, for example, the role of uh, naval aviation. Although I feel it was significant in 1943 and beyond. Was not as was not you know was not a fast carrier type of uh, a conflict and the stories that ensue from that. But I think it's you know it's it's rich in history and certainly for somebody who uh, lives on the uh, the East Coast, um, there was a substantial threat to uh, uh, the Eastern Seaboard and certainly the ships that were just offshore much more so than was the case in the uh, in the Pacific War. That was kind of a, a far-off war. Um, and this one, the Battle of the Atlantic, was actually closer to home than, than a lot of people realize today. Right. And it's the longest campaign of the war, um, so you can't discount it in any way, shape, or form. You can't discount it, although it's kind of, you know, it's kind of uh, hard to... Um, you know, parse. Uh, you know, it's it's small conflict after small conflict in the Battle of the Atlantic, and it goes on. Um, but it's hard to you know, it's hard to pinpoint a, a huge battle like like Midway or um, right. uh, and, and and so forth. There aren't that those those big dramatic battles. Right. But, you know, the battles that that are there are very uh, specific and interesting and intense. Right. Well, this is a very um, interesting and intense, um, more int intricate uh, nighttime naval battle, one on one from the Battle of the Atlantic. And folks, you got to get this book. I tell you, it'll be the most page turner sea story you read this winter. Um, 
And um, I myself. Thanks for the promo. Thanks for the promo. I appreciate that. No, I think people will find that. I mean, I it's, uh, you know, I describe myself more uh, as an historic uh, history storyteller than in, in a story. And I'm trying to uh, deliver the, the personal um, visceral element uh, to this, to the Battle of the Atlantic. And the best way to do that is through the individuals, the unique individuals that actually participated. Especially in the, on this particular destroyer, this aging destroyer, uh, in the middle of this larger um, thing going on, and uh, yeah, there's, really a of, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, I find as I, I talk about this book before groups, a lot of people know about these Clemson destroyers uh, and these Wix destroyers, these four Pipers. They're kind of uh, iconic uh, vessels in the history of the. The U.S. Navy. I mean, they were originally they were literally tin cans because of their structure. But you know, there's a lot of uh, affection and interest in that that those classes of ships. Indeed, the there is. Served on them. Yeah, indeed, there is. Well, David, it's been wonderful to have you on the podcast. We look forward to having you on here again sometime in the future. Right. Um, uh, once again, folks, the book is Duel in the Deep: The Hunters, the Hunted, and the High Seas Fight to the Finish. David Sears is the author, and he's been our guest today. Thank you very much, David. It's been a pleasure well, talking with you. Thank you. That's it for us for this time, folks. Uh, until next time, I'm Naval, I am Naval History Editor-in-Chief Eric Mills signing off. Take care. Take care.